Yeah, I think uh, I'm now okay. Let me show, um, I, let me show, okay. I had to repeat some things here. Um, so the thing is Shankarabhashya uh, here is very complex. And that what we are trying to do is getting and reading the concepts and trying to explain the concepts presented in that book uh, by Gangoli, G-A-N-G-O-L-L-I, which I have uh, uh, published on Telegram. Uh, okay, let's try to understand the concepts as best as we can. And um, this time we'll go to some level and see where the concepts end up. If you have questions, we can talk. I'm taking it a little bit slow than um, what I really want to do. But the concepts of bhakti, concepts of jnana nishtha, concepts of saguna brahman, concepts of the 13th chapter, Kshetra, Kshetra Jnana, all these are extremely complex in Shankara Bhashya. And uh, no wonder you will, uh, you know, many, many other authors have looked at it seriously and tried to understand it, but um, it's, it's not easy, as simple as that. Has anybody studied the 13th chapter, Shankara Bhashya? Anyone? I have gone through that, and uh, but uh, Shetra, mean, Shetra, yeah, it, uh, dealing with Shetra and Shetra, yeah, the teacher. What did you read a translation or the original? Uh, no, I can't read original the translation, and also Ganguly also went through his uh, what you posted that one in the introduction, um, introductory portion of that. But Shetra, Shetra, yeah, I went through the translation. Okay, okay, so you understand it clearly. Clearly, something. Okay, let's see. All right, uh, so let me uh, try to... I have gone uh, through the uh, uh, Dr. Ashri uh, Gangoli's book, but it is very difficult to understand. It's very confusing. It, it's very um, concise, and he makes statements, and you don't know why he makes those statements. Uh, so it's not that easy. Not that easy. Okay, let's let me... See. Uh, see, usually... I'm okay uh, preparing for this class for just in about three to four hours of preparation. Usually it's sufficient for me to explain something for each class. But today, even having a lot more time to prepare, I could not get to the point where I wanted to be. Okay, let me sh show you where I am right now. Uh, share screen. Tell me if you can see my screen. Yes. Interesting. Uh, let's see if... Coming up. So it's stuck a little bit. Let me see why it's stuck. Now you can see? Yes. Uh, that is lecture 103. Yes. Okay. All right. So the thing is, what we're going to do is last time I explained the verses uh, 1155. We, uh, I think we probably talked about 1865 also. Okay. So this is the summary of the Karma Yoga, which ends up in the Bhakti Yoga, according to Shankaracharya. And that uh, that is... And also entire Gita Shastra, uh, Shastra Sara, or the summary of the Gita Shastra was explained in those verses. And it was also stated that Saguna Brahma worship occurs in the state of ignorance because there is a difference between self and Ishvara at that time. That means a self, uh, uh, the thing is, Veda means in the sense that the person who is worshipping is seeing obviously bheda or difference. And the term used by Shankaracharya here is atracha atma ishvara bheda maashritya. That is, ishvara and atma are different. Vishwarupe ishvare. 
in Vishwarupa, uh, Ishwara, who sh shows the Vishwarupa in the 11th chapter, Cheta Samadhana Rakshanaha, mind being focused on the Ishwara, that kind of yoga was said in the 11th chapter. That is, focusing on that Ishwara who showed the Vishwarupa. Ishwarartham Karmanushtanadicha, that means, Dedicated to that Ishvara, all the actions are done. All these details were given. And this involves bheda or difference between the worshipped and the worshipper. The worshipped is Vishwarupa, that is uh, Brahman, with, who shows the Vishwarupa. And worshipper is an individual. Yasmacha, Arjunasya, Atyanta Meva Hitaihi Bhagavan. Look at this, Sh Shankaracharya's words here. Yasmacha, that means because Arjunasya Atyanta Meva Hitaishi Bhagavan, Arjuna's very close friend and well wisher is this Bhagavan. Tasya Samyak Darshana Ananmlitam Karma Yogam Veda Drishti Manta Meva Upadishati. He gives or gives the instructions, gives the details prescription of karma yoga, which does not involve the true knowledge, samyak darshana ananvitam, that means which does not involve the true knowledge of Brahman. But this karma yoga also has bheda drishti manta meva, that means it involves difference, where there is number of different things. That is being given to Arjuna, Arjuna, Lord Bhagavan knows what is right for Arjuna because Arjuna is not at the level to receive the final Samyak Darshan Rupa, the true knowledge of Brahman. And so, Karma Yoga, which involves difference, is being instructed by Sri Krishna to Arjuna. How does one get direct moksha? That is only from the knowledge of Brahman, which is devoid of all adjuncts or upadhis. So you take away all the upadhis away from Brahman, then only you get direct moksha, that is realization of Brahman. And that is explained in the verses 13, 12, 13, 14, 13, 15, 13, 17, 13, 18. Guess what? Can anybody tell me how big is the Bhashya of Shankaracharya on the, on the earlier verses of 13th chapter? That is the first two or three verses of the 13th uh, chapter. Any idea? Particularly the shloka I'm talking about is Khetragnyan Chapimam Vidhi Sarva Kshetreshu Bharata. Khetragnyo Yor Jnanam Yattat Jnanam Matam Mama. This is the verse on which Shankaracharya goes for a several pages to explain the details of this verse. Okay. Uh, can I uh, ask you something here, or, yeah. or am I inter interrupting? Sure, According to Shankara, as I understand, that uh, uh, this uh, karma and then dhyana, he's, he uses meditation or yoga and then bhakti. So. Uh, jnana doesn't come into the picture of uh, 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 the jiva, I mean the self when we are acting. It's only when we attain jnana, that is when you are in the shetra level, you recognize the shetra and is doing everything, then only we get uh, enlightenment. Am I right? I didn't understand your question. No, I was asking. Question is, uh, unless uh, uh, we remove the shetra and go to the shetranya, that was, uh, we realize it is uh, the divine that is doing everything and forget uh, that karma and dhyana and uh, uh, bhakti have no role in the attainment of uh, enlightenment. See, the thing is, uh, then what has the role in Jnana, attaining? that is knowledge. knowledge. See, then the when we identify the... ourselves with the Brahman, that Shetranya. Yes. Yeah, it is uh, generally true. What you said is generally true, but uh, the details are the main things. 
right? Okay. So what is the path? Is there a path to that? What is the path, jnana, and what is the final palak jnana, or the fruit? What is the nature of the fruit? What is the nature of the path to the fruit? These are a little bit complex in, in the Vashya of Shankaracharya. I'm sure number of people might have understood it, you know, gone, in, uh, gone uh, very deep into it, and I'm sure they, they have talked about it in the past. I am trying to uh, understand it in my own way, how to make sense of it. That's all. Okay? Okay. Now, see, if somebody says, okay, 13, 12, 13, 14, 13, 15, 13, 17, 13, 18, these verses tell you about direct moksha. Unless you know what these verses are, how can you know the concept? The concept is hidden. Sometimes um, you have to dig a little deeper. I'm trying to dig a little deeper here. Okay. Vyem yattat pravakshami yajnatva amritamashtute anadimat param brahma na satta na this is a very important verse. Gnayam Brahma is the true Brahman to be known. Yat pravakshyami, whatever I am going to say, this is Lord Krishna's words in the Bhagavad Gita. Knowing that Gnayam Brahma, Amritattva Mashrate, that is, you will get immortality. Anadimat param Brahma, na sat. Tat na asaduchyate. Anadimat, according to Shankaracharya, is this Brahma is eternal, without beginning. Na sat, it is not existing and it is not not existing. That means it cannot be known by the terms existing and not existing. Okay. So, uh, this verse needs some explanation, okay? Let me see what... Okay, oh, wait a minute, just a second. Okay, here. Okay. Here, other Acharyas um, attack Shankaracharya. Why does Shankaracharya break this word into anadi mat and param brahma separately. And anadi mat is one word for Shankaracharya. Uh, that means beginningless, that's all. That the word mat doesn't mean anything else for Shankaracharya because that is the nature of that entity which is beginningless. That's all there. So, the Gnayam Brahma is the Brahma to be known. And by knowing that Brahman, one gets immortality. And that Brahman is beginningless. And the Brahm, Brahman is not that which is known by the term existing. And it is not the, uh, what is known by the term not existing. Because these do not define Brahman. Brahman cannot be known by anything which, which is stated as existing or not existing. This is how... Uh, this verse is understood. We will leave it as it is right now because if we go into details of Shankarabhasha, it is extremely long. And we'll explain only where it is necessary, okay? Here. Because we are now dealing with concepts, not details of the, the, uh, the commentary. The details of the commentary will be present, uh, will be taught word by word, sentence by sentence, when we go into details, that will go for a very long time. Now I understand that Bhagavad Gita is extremely complicated. And uh, we have to thank everybody who, uh, who are participating in this because we are taking an extremely serious look at Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Now, I'm directly using Swami Shivananda's translation here, just for simplicity. Uh, and the 1313, that is the verse we talked about just now, that is, Gnayam Yatat Pravakshami, that is 13, not 13. The meaning is, I will declare that, that is Krishna says to Arjuna, I will, de de I will declare that which has to be known, knowing which one attains immortality, the beginningless Supreme Brahman called neither being nor non-being. So it cannot be known by the terms being or non-being. 
So this is what Shivananda says. It fairly looks correct, actually. Sarvataha Panipadam, that Sarvatokshi, this is the next verse. Sarvataha Panipadam, that Sarvatokshi Shromukham, Sarvataha Shrutiman Loke, Sarvam Avritya Tishtati. What it means here is, in the same Shivananda's translation, Sarvataha Panipadam means everywhere the hands are there. That is, Brahman's hands are everywhere. Sati Sarvata Akshi Shiromukham. Everywhere Brahman is seeing through the eyes. Akshi Shiromukham. He has the face and heads and eyes everywhere. Sarvata Hashadimal Loke. Ears everywhere. Listens to every conversation. Sarvam Avarti Tishtati. He envelops everything and stays. Exists. That's what this um, uh, translation is saying. With hands and feet everywhere, with eyes, heads, and mouths everywhere, with ears everywhere, he exists in the world, enveloping, enveloping all. So this is the translation. So, wow, this is uh, Brahman, as said in the 13th chapter and uh, 14th shloka. Now see what happens in the next shloka. Sarvendriya guna bhasam, sarvendriya vivarjitam, asaktam sarvavrutchaivani gunam gunabhuktracha. Here, the translation is shining by the functions of all the senses. Sarva indriya guna bhasam. Indriyas are different. Karma indriyas and jnana, jnana indriyas. It is shining through these senses. Sarva indriya vivarjitam. It does not have any senses at all. Asaktam. Unattached. Sarva Bhritchaiva. It supports everything. Nirgunam. Devoid of qualities. Guna Bhoktricha. Yet their experiencer. That is the experiencer of Gunas. Wow. Look at this. In here it is Nirgunam. That means, clearly speaking, no attributes of any kind. But immediately it follows with an attribute. Guna Bhoktricha. It experiences gunas. How do you understand this nirguna term here? Guess. Guess what Shankaracharya says for this term nirguna. Does he say that it is absolutely attributeless or something else? Any guess? Anyone? Not disturbed by any gunas. Not disturbed. What did you say? Uh, not influenced by any gunas. That's not what, uh, what do you call, that's not ex exactly what Shankaracharya says there. Slightly different. Because Shankaracharya realizes that he cannot put the term absolutely attributeless here, right? Nirguna cannot mean absolutely attributeless. Why? Because immediately it says guna bhoktru, that Brahman is the experiencer of gunas. Uh, Krishna, and it's also Sarva Vritti is supporter of everything. Beyond no, the we, impact we, of gunas is probably what I'm trying to say. What did you say? Beyond the influence and impact of the gunas. Like, you know, like we are, we are impacted and influenced by gunas and, and the Supreme Brahman is not. See, the question is, what are the gunas here? The gunas are, what, what does the guna mean here? That is the question. Uh, see, does, does, guna it mean, mean that, uh... does guna mean all the attributes? That is, without any attributes. Is that what the meaning of guna is? Nirguna. I'm telling about the word nirguna. Nirguna means, guna means attribute. Nirguna means no attribute. That means, do you mean to say that it has no attributes and immediately say it is it is the experiencer, experiencer of attributes? How can you say this? It is oxymoron. So what is the real meaning of Nirguna here? See, Nirguna Brahman, according to Shankara, is the essence. Finally, it is the essence. So even Nirguna Brahman, according to Shankara, is the essence. Even Saguna, Brahman, even Saguna Brahman, even the experience or Guna, whatever we are experiencing, it cannot be experienced without the Nirguna Brahman in the background. I understand. But see, the thing is here, 
apparently this particular 13th uh, chapter verses are describing the Gnayam Brahma. Gnayam Brahma is the ultimate Brahman to be known according to Shankaracharya. And that has to be Nirguna Brahman. And if it is Nirguna Brahman, the word Nirguna here should mean absolutely attributeless. And if that is so, this verse cannot be explained properly because asaktam, it is unattached, that becomes a guna. Sarvabhat is, supports everything in the universe, that becomes a guna. Guna bhoktra, experiencer of gunas, that becomes an attribute. So nirguna pada cannot be explained as attributeless. Do you realize that? Do you understand this? See, I'm taking you step by step by step to understand Shankara Bhasha here. I don't want to jump in. And I want, to, uh, you know, three line summaries, 10 line summaries that will not work. I'm giving you a concept, even if it takes one or two classes extra, you need to understand the concept. And these po uh, unique points are not raised anywhere. Other people are not focusing on it properly. I'm not seeing that. The, even the commentaries, you know, glance over these terms. Poor, poor people have done a very good job of explaining it in English, translating everything into English. Hard work, I'm telling you, very hard work. But the focus is not clear. If I ask this question, Nirguna means attributeless, and there are so many attributes uh, mentioned here. Sarvendriya Guna Bhasam is also an attribute that which is known through all the senses. And immediately, Sarvendriya Vibharjitam, which does not have any senses, that becomes an attribute. So is this something like saying, you know, when we say asatyam, um, explained, that is explained as asatyat vyavruttam? Satyam is asatyat vyavruttam? See, the thing is, um, well, that is explained in a different context, right? That is Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma, their attributes. But to avoid the attribute aspect of it, Satyam, they are uh, given a negative connotation as which is that which is not Asatya, that which is not Ajnana, that which is not finite. In that sense, those terms come there in Shankarabhasya when they want to explain Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma. But here, that's not the situation. The situation is here, Nirgunam, uh, see, there uh, in that example you told, Brahman is not explicable directly through any kind of direct terms. And that's what it says. Okay. Here, there is, the, uh, there, is, there is an oxymoron in this whole uh, verse. Part of it says it does not have any, it does not have any attributes. The rest of the whole shloka is saying it has attributes. It is non-understandable. This sentence is not at all understandable. Maybe it is, uh, uh, could be that uh, nirguna means something which is not uh, uh, possible to sense using the senses. Just because of that, it has been written as nirguna. Hold a thought. Hold a thought. We will see the Shankarabhasya directly. I wanted to give a, a, a kind of preamble for the Shankarabhasya here. Because Shankar, Shankaracharya realizes that. right? There is a problem here. He realizes that. And see how he goes around. Goes around the whole thing. Okay, let's read the Shankar Bhasha now, okay? One more thing, uh, Krishna. Uh -huh. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Can, yeah. Uh, devoid of qualities, yet they're experiencer. See, can it also be told that Brahman basically is Nirguna and Brahman is one, but the Jagat and Jiva is actually uh, observed by none other than the Brahman himself, finally, according to Advaita. So can it be looked at it in that way? Though, yeah, though, though, 
though at the paramarthic level it does not act, it does not see the world or anything but it itself observes everything see that is an issue here why does uh, so it is 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 ishwara bound then because he is observing something which is not itself right jiva and jada brahman, brahman is basically attributeless yes but at yes. the same time but at he the same time all, all these things are happening in brahman himself okay let so it happen in brahman himself let it happen in is he the witness yes okay if it is a witness he is seeing something yes no it's not like that what i wanted to tell what i wanted to tell was basically at the paramarthic level uh, brahman brahman i mean there is no jagat there is no jiva anything it is without qualities but it is in the same brahman all this is happening there how so is even though it, is brahman aware of it no no brahman is not aware because there at the paramarthic level it is actually one but at the vyavaharikal it itself observe it itself is observing at the vyavaharikal stage also because everything happens in brahman only because there is only one okay the thing is is that what shankaracharya says how does he say and how is it said in the original bhagavad gita see no, no, are, remember, what is the purpose, what is the purpose of this whole exercise the purpose of this exercise is to determine what is the original text of bhagavad gita and how shankaracharya explains it and as he make this kind of essence out of these verses and that has to be proven that has okay, to be see, known i can I, i mean you can see it in two ways one thing is the generic view of shankara uh, that is uh, i think you had quoted some example some time back i mean usually this also occurs in many of the advaitic lectures that when we are watching a movie it is the screen actually which is compared to the nirguna brahman and all the other things projections are actually something which is happening in the jagat like that so behind all those thing all those things which is happening is a static thing so it it is attributeless basically but it appears with attributes so this is a generic view of where they combine both attributelessness and attributes this is one way of interpreting another way of seeing another way of seeing this is is it possible that based on the context even shankara actually takes into different uh, he gives different definition for nirguna based on context yes that is a good point you brought yes shankara acharya does not give a consistently same definition of nirguna everywhere that's what i am i am learning now and i'm learning piece by piece and i'm telling you what i'm learning this word nirguna is not exactly absolutely attribute less according to shankara acharya here and that is what we are going to say study in his bhashya now okay now one, one last thought is it nirguna meaning without the sattva rajas tamas Be- that's what it i is. Di- okay that's i didn't say that saying. initially because it does not fit the rest of the shloka shankara acharya says here nirguna means that which does not have sattva rajas tamo gunas but you that's know that is. doesn't fit the context of this particular shloka Or whatever it is, that is what Shankara Chaturjee takes it here. Acha. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. Okay. I'll hold back. Yeah. No problem. I did not go through the whole Shank- uh, Shankar Bhasha here. That is why I put dot 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 dot. The initial part of it I am not explaining. Only here. Kasmat punaha karanat na vyapr vyapratam meva iti grishyate iti da iti ta aha. The Sarvendriya guna basam means it is um, you know known. it is shining through the activities of the different sense organs we have right because of the sense organs are working the eyes are seeing the ears are hearing the mind is thinking you think uh, you know this brahman is expressed shines forth because of the activities of all the senses what brahman itself does not have any senses sarvendriya vivarchitam इंद्रिया 
which is known as Gnayam Brahma or the Brahman to be known. Yastu Ayam Mantraha, Avani Pado Javano Grihita, Pashati Chakshu Sashano Tekarnaha. This is the Shwedashwata Upanishad. In that Upanishad, it says, Oh, that Brahman does not have hands or legs, but he is faster and he can hold anything and he is faster than everybody. Pashati Achakshu, he sees, but he does not have eyes. Sashrunoti Akarnaha, he, Brahman hears, but does not have uh, ears. This is Shweta Shweta 319. So even in that Shweta Shweta, similar ideas are brought forth. Sasarvendriya upadhi guna anugunya bhajana shakti mat tadnyayam ityevam pradarshana pradarshanartaha. That means, um, Gunanu Gunya Bhajana Shakti Mat Sarvendriya Upadi Guna Anugunya Bhajana Shakti Mat Tatnyam Ityam Pradashanartaha. So the Indriyas are all Upadis for that. Upadi Guna Anugunya Bhajana Shakti Mat. Uh, whether he um, Natu Saksha Deva Yavanadi Kriyatva Pradashanartaha. That means he, he, is, he is referred to through the Indriyas, but he is not directly moving or holding. That is, Apani Pado means he does not have hands, but he can hold and he can, uh, he is fast. All this activity is superimposed on that Brahman. It is not truly Brahman's nature. That is the idea here. Na sakshadeva yavanadi kriyavatva pradashnata. He does not have actions of any kind. Brahman is still. Ando mani avindata means uh, a blind man knew about the money or the, or the jewel. It is a taithiri aranika, some statement there. It is a strange statement. How can a, a blind person know about a, uh, what do you call jewel? No, he cannot. But there is some, so it's a, it, in the similar way, you have to say that Brahman does not have any actions. Ityadi mantra arthavati tasya mantra mantrasya arthaha. Well, good in detail when we really want to go in depth about all these shlokas because I missed some earlier portion of the, um, uh, you know, bhashya also here because this bhashya is very big here. I want to quickly finish it. Okay, here. Yasmat sarva karna virajita varjitam gyem. That means Brahman does not have any indriyas. Tasmat asaktam sarva samshlesha varjitam. Samshlesha is connection, attachments, right? He does not have any attachments. Yadyapi evam yatathapi sarva bhrit eva, sarva bhritsha eva. Even though it is true that he is not connected with any, anyone, he is supporting everything. Like how the ground supports mirage, like the, uh, what do you call, uh, exactly what I thought. Here he's, he himself says, Sadaspadam hi sarvam tarvatra sadbuddhyanu gamate. So for all the universal things here, what is the basis? The basis is sadaspadam. That is sat is the basis, substance, substrate, substratum. Sat is existence. That is Brahman. And that is the, uh, the support of everything. In that sense, it is Sarva Brit. Even though non attached, not attached to anything. Nahi Mrigatrishnikada Yopi Niras Padaha Bhavanti. The mirage does not, uh, cannot occur without a substratum if there is no road, which is very hot. How can you see the reflections at an angle which is known as a mirage and which appears like water? So the mirage cannot occur without the hot road underneath, which creates this um, layers of different dense density uh, uh, air, right? The air, air with different densities uh, are created by, because of the hot surface of the road. So you need the road for the, the mirage uh, illusion to occur. So, whole of this universe, which is illusory, 
is due to the basis which is the underlying ground ataha sarvabhrut sarvam vibharti in that sense it holds on it is it holds everything actually it doesn't hold or it doesn't support anything but in that sense syatidam cha anyat jeyasya satvadhigam gam sapta satvadhigam dwaram other aspects also regarding this jnayam brahma should be understood in that what is the satvadhigam dwaram gunas nirgunam means शब्दारिद्वारेणाधिदारेणाधि तथापि मीन्स मीन्स आर एक्सप्लेन इन डिफरेंट नेचर ऑफ मैटर इन दैट मीन्स थ्रू दी डोर्स ऑफ शब्द रसा रूप गंध शब्द इज साउंड फॉर्म टेस्ट स्मेल दीज आर ऑल थ्रू दीज sukha dukha sukha that is sorrow and happiness delusion all this parinatanam all this are transformed in these forms that is experienced bhoktra is experiencer experienced by brahman but shankaracharya carefully avoids the word bhoktra here bhoktra is experiencer but he says upalabdrasha he knows upalabdha means that person who knows how can bhoktra means upalab upalabdha in a way right you know that has to be understood in a way according to shankaracharya tat nyayam ityaktaha see you look at it shankaracharya has tough tough time doing the meaning here the the words original words are very tough to explain uh, explain upalabdha uh, can upalabdha knowing means enjoying yeah in a way right i saw a movie does it mean i enjoyed through the sight it's not that direct but we just have to accept it so shankaracharya yeah one comment krishna if yeah. uh, shankaracharya takes the meaning of nirguna as free from sattva rajas tamas even ramanuja gives the same interpretation here probably the, not not only here whenever the term nirguna comes even he takes yeah, the meaning yeah yeah hey guna rahita tum or something like that yes yes that is true and i will get to, get to the ramanuja bhasha later it will become too much of a diversion that i just didn't we can always go check if you want also krishna on slide 5 a uh, slide 4 it said uh, all uh, you know um, hands eyes and everything and slide 5 it says without the hands and uh, chakshu and etc etc so uh, they seem to be in direct contradiction between slide 4 and 5 see the thing is uh, the, basically sarvendriya gunapadam sarvendriya varit asaktam um here sarvata pani padam tat right so yes. here it talks yeah, right. about yeah. all this indriyas yes and yes. the next one it true. says it's w- without indriyas exactly yes true so so what it is it appears to have all these things but it does not See, at the end of the day, it does not. Right? That is the nirguna brahman for Shankaracharya. Okay. So it cannot have any connect to anything. It has to be totally left separate. Yeah. Somehow yeah. it is associated in ignorance. It is associated. We think it's associated because of ignorance. Is actually not associated at all. I think I get a better understanding of Casey's statement that. But Krishna gave a lot of tough time to all acharyas. Yeah, that is a Dr. Anantanga Acharya, Narasimha's uh-huh. father. Dr. Right. Anantanga Acharya, Krishna is very impartial person. He gave the same amount of difficulty to all acharyas to understand Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, yeah. So, 
uh, one uh, means that tatapi uh, guna bhoktum is saying it appears to be all these qualities but it is not that that is the final meaning of that tatapi guna bhoktrucha guna sattva rajas tamasya shabdani means it is uh, finally saying you look it is having all these features but it is not having such features that is what Correct. it is yes yes true uh, then the why like that is in directly in shloka uh, acharya could have written like this uh, statement and given us sir that uh, this uh, not having this all qualities why is why acharya is using nirguna in one place and then adding like this because the common reader will be separate separate study no sir now because krishna's original words are like that right bhagavad gita is like that that is why it is tough 13th chapter is very tough and um, uh, you know we can do a, a thesis on 13th chapter and analyzing two or three bhashyas on it by going very deep you understand the problems in 13th chapter then bahirantascha bhutanam acharam charame vacha sukshmatvat tad avigneyam dhurastham chantike chatat the next shloka here bahir antascha bhutanam it is inside and outside all the living beings charam acharam charam acharame vacha it is move it is moving and not moving sukshmatvat tad avigneyam it is sukshma means subtle so that is not knowable tad avigneyam durastham cha antike chatate it is far and near so here many acharyas do it similar way the shloka uh, translation from shivananda is with, uh, swami shivananda without and within all beings the unmoving and also moving because of its subtlety knowable and near and far away is that so that general meaning uh see shankaracharya takes it in a slightly different way um that is he explains in in the in the uh uh well, i'm thinking whether to don't worry about it because it say, it says um uh near and far he says that if somebody has amanitva the gunas the gunas of you know not having ego and other things like that that person goes near to brahman if that person does not have those gunas then he will go far away from brahman so those are all very well explained by in shankar bhashya here it's moving and not moving means it appears to be moving because of the beings because so many people move around animals people cars uh, airplanes they are more around but really speaking what is not moving is inside brahman is the support for all those things but brahman is not moving in that sense shankaracharya takes it it is very subtle अविभक्त च भूतेशु विभक्त स्थित भूत भर्त चेयम ग्रसिष्णु प्रभ विष्णु मीनिंग इज अविभक्त दट इज अंडिवेडेड इन इन ऑल द बीइंग्स विभक्त स्थित इट अपियर्स टू बी डिवाइडेड बै ऑल दीइंग्स भूत भर्त सपोर्टर ऑफ एव्रीथिंग चेयम ग्रसिष्णु प्रभ विष्णु चट इज इट इज इट 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 डिजोल एव्रीथिंग एंड इट क्रिएट्स एव्रीथिंग so this is brahman saguna brahman who creates and dissolves everything it supports everything it appears to be divided but it is one in everything that is the idea here i have a question here yeah uh, is, is isn't it in this context uh, shankara takes uh, name to be akshara right not the cosmic form a saguna brahman this is here actually brahman itself but saguna brahman is mistaken that means appears to be like that appears to be just like how uh the mirage is created by the ground right you need the ground to create the mirage but that the ground is unconnected to the mirage right so uh in that sense the nirguna brahman is the basis actually but saguna brahman is the one which is assumed to be the real creator so uh, saguna brahman is what we see and nirguna brahman is what it is actually 
But in this Can context, he is mm-hmm. in this context, he is speaking of Akshara Brahma, right? What difference does it make? Yeah. Akshara is Akshara is an imperishable Brahman. Yes, true. Yes, okay. true. Imperishable means, but how can that be creator and dissolver of the universe and supporter of the universe? So that is actually Saguna Brahman. But that can also be Nirguna Brahman in the sense if you look at the in that way. Actually, this is the problem in Shankar Bhasha. In Shankar Bhasha, the Saguna Brahman is, if you want, we'll go to the, the original Vasha. It doesn't take much time. Oops, wait a minute. Okay, let me go to the original Vasha. I'll show you. Okay. Uh, 13. Let me share the screen, which is a different one. You can see my screen, right? Yes, uh, Krishna, you can see. Okay. Uh, Let's see which one that is not the one. Seventeen, right? Next one, next one. Seventeen. Avibhaktan cha bhuteshu vibhakta miva cha sthitam. Bhuta bhartha cha tadnyayam gasishnu prabhavishnu cha. Here, avibhaktam. Shankar Basha, avibhaktam cha pratideham yomavat tadekam. Like space, it is in everybody. Bhuteshu sarva pranishu vibhakta miva cha sthitam. It appears to be separated within the bodies. Because of different, uh, you know, each body has a different uh, uh, sh- shape and restricted uh, space. Deheshveva vibhavyamanatpat. Bhuta bhartucha, bhutani vibharti, tat nyayam, bhuta bhartu. That it supports all the beings. Bhuta bhartucha, sthiti kale. Sthiti kale means after creation, it supports everybody. Pralaya kale grasishnu, grasana shilam. That means it eats up. Utpatti kale prabhavishnu. It creates when at the time of creation. Prabhavana shilam yatha rajva. How does it create? Yatha rajva dihi. Like how the ropes create the serpents. Mithya kalpitasya. Imaginarily it creates. Kincha sarvatra vidyamanam apita sat na upalabhyate chete nyayantamaha tarhina. He gives an intro to the next verse. If it is not understood, understood everywhere. And that means that means sarvatra, sarvatra vidyamanamapi, even though it exists everywhere, it is not understood, it is not experienced, it doesn't, it's not understood. How then what is it? Is it pure darkness? Then he says, No, it is not darkness, it is light. And that comes in the next shloka. But here, this is taken more towards the Saguna aspect, right? But the thing is, is mainly he's meaning the Nirguna aspect here. So, the, this Nirguna appears to have Saguna. Like how the rope appears as a serpent. Nothing is indicated in the original shloka. Right? Avibhaktam cha bhuteshu, vibhaktam yastitam. Bhuta bhartha cha tadnyayam grasishnu prabha vishnu cha. Here, all the original stages, undivided, but it appears as if it is divided. Vibhaktam mivacha sitam. It is as if divided. Right? It doesn't appear. The word appear does not exist here. Bhuta bhartha cha tadnyayam. It supports all the beings. Rasishnu, it eats up everything in the pralaya. Obviously, pralaya is not mentioned here. We should assume. Prabhu Vishnu, it creates everything. But the mithya aspect of it, mithya kalpitasya, that means imaginary aspect of this is introduced by Shankaracharya here. There is no snake rope, snake rope illusion mentioned in the entire Bhagavad Gita. That you need to remember. Understood? 
Yeah, so it is not actually very clear. Then uh, part of it can be nirguna, part of it can be taken as saguna. It sounds like that. Then. Yeah, yeah. So that is why Gangoli's summary is not as good as it appears. He summarizes too much. That Niyam Brahma, you have, to, uh, you have to understand that it is the Nirguna Brahman, which is explained in the terms of the language of the ignorance of Beda. We are all using the language of difference because without that language, I cannot explain. All of us will become Nirguna Brahman. There is no you, there is no me, there is no nothing. So all transactions stop. Okay. Now we'll go to the next sloka or come back to the. Uh, I will just show the. What is this? Uh, uh, stop share and I will do a new share. And this is the. And we'll finish this sloka quickly. So, next sloka is Jyotishama Pita Jyotihi Tamasa Paramuchate from the current slide. Our point is slow. Uh, I wonder if I use uh, Google Slides, it may be better. I wanted to use Google Slides. I have to start all over now to Google Slides. That's why I'm not doing it. Okay. Jyotishama Pita Jyotihi, it is the light of all lights. And it is beyond the darkness. Tamasaha paramuchyate. It's beyond darkness. Jnanam jnayam. That is knowledge. Jnana jnaya. That is to be known. Jnana gamyam. That is the fruit of the knowledge. Hridi sarvasya vishtitam. It is in the hearts of every, everyone. So even here, see, look at it. Saguna looks like saguna to me. Right? But uh, Gangoli says that's all nirguna brahman oriented. oriented. Right? And uh, even Shankaracharya, the guna word, he uses a Saturajasama guna, not attributeless the way we understand. So if you look at all those things, now you get a feeling of Shankaracharya's view on the 13th chapter. And he shifts between Saguna and Nirguna very quickly because everything is an appearance at this point. Because the guy who is perceiving is also an appearance. At least in the snake rope illusion, if there is a perceiver that is us. And to us, it appears, the rope appears to be like a snake for us. There, in, for Shankara the the, uh, the seer or the uh, experience of knower and all, that itself is illusory. So what is true is the basis, which is Nirguna, which is just inexplicable, which, because of which everything operates, but that is involved, not involved at all in anything. And even the creation, sustenance, dissolution of the universe is apparent. It appears to be like that. So there is really no creation. There is no real sustenance. There is no real maintenance. There is no real uh, process of any kind. There is no dissolution. All these things are illusory. To whom? The person who thinks he is bound. And who is that? That's the jiva. He thinks that he is bound. When the knowledge comes, what happens? There is no jiva. There is nothing to be known. And the, only the bottom, which is the substratum, which is Brahman, exists. And nothing else exists. Hope this is clear, that at least we have understood Shankara Bhashya on these few shlokas. And Gangoli did a very powerful... See, I'll show you Gangoli. Uh, let me uh, quickly show you what I'm saying here. Stop share. And I'm going to open my Gangoli stop. And I'll do another. Uh, share screen. Mm. Uh, 
no, 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 no. I have to get out of here. See, suppose I do this. So here, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we okay. can see. Yeah, just hold on a second. Uh, let me just, see, I'm very slow in explaining Gangoli. I realize that because I want to be very clear on the concepts myself to explain to you. You know how subtle and difficult the explanations are, right? See, I'm, I studied only so much. Today, I was stuck here in this 13th, see, he makes a statement here, right? Uh, he makes a statement here. Let's read the statement. But, um, okay, this is the best among all the dis disciplines recommended in the Gita. Uh, okay, let me just increase this. Okay. Uh, hence, one should direct all his mind and intellect to the Saguna aspect of God, and to be his devotee performing the duties enjoined by him only. Okay. That is 11.55. Now, this is the best among all the disciplines recommended in the Gita for attaining liberation. That is, I don't know, this 9.84 is an error. 11.55, 18.65. This is Matkarma Krit Mat Paramaha, Matbhakta Sangha Vardhyataha, Nirvaira Sarva Bhuteshu Yasamati Mameti Pandava. That is the one here. Here is also Manmana Bhava Madhbhagdha Madhyaji Manmanaspara. But because even this contemplation on Saguna Brahman has to be practiced on the basis of ignorance, which projects the difference between the self and the Ishvara or the Lord, direct emancipation of liberation is attained only from the knowledge of Brahman devoid of all adjuncts. That is 1312, 1314, and 1315, 1313, and 1318. See here, they talk about the adjuncts. He's a supporter of everything, but he's, he does not have any indriyas, he does not have any hands, or he does not have any actions. So devoid of all those actions, all those upadis are, are adjuncts. You have to understand Brahman. That is liberation according to what this person is saying. right? Moksha is direct understanding of all that is false and denial of everything which is false, which includes the knower and the known. Because Brahman cannot be known. The knower and the known does not include Brahman. It's a projection. It's all this imaginary, transactory a world of Vyavaharika Satya. Hope this is clear. What I was supposed to do a lot more here, Jnana initiated in Gita. This becomes very difficult. You know why? Right here is a problem, 13.2. Khetra Gyan Chapimam Viddi Sarva Khetra Shubharata. That is, that has 10 pages of Shankar Bhasha there. Very hard. And there, Shankara has other problems. He uses Sankhya theory and uh, Vaisheshika theory and says his theory is different from that. Gita does not support Sankhya or Vaisheshika. That is his view, right? And then there is something known as the Tatatya Ishvara. What is Tatastha Ishvara? That also we need to understand. So, these are difficult. And that is why he goes and says, why is uh, Gita, uh, that is the uh, 13th chapter, different? The main thing about this Gangoli is, this has been concluded by Sri Shankaracharya, and he has further argued it out that in the Gita Shastra, the jnana or knowledge of the non-dual self, or Atman alone, has been enunciated. There's nothing else important, only the non-dual knowledge of the Brahman, Atman. So this is what he tries to prove in so many arguments. And then he quotes like, you know, so many statements of the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, so many, so it is hard, unless you know these original verses, you cannot understand this logic. See how difficult it is? So Satkar, you are Krishna, one, one, one thing can be said here. Uh, Bhagavan is very direct in 1155 by telling him that Matkarmakran, Matparamo, taking him to be the highest. But the problem here is Shankara is trying to introduce the Upanishad thoughts here. Yes. 
yes, that is yeah. where there's it's where there's a difficulty in interpreting the bhagavad gita see shankara uses uses upanishads to interpret bhagavad gita and ramanuja acharya try, tries to avoid it ramanuja acharya in, uh, directly makes sense out of what krishna said 90% of the time and introduces upanishads only when needed but shankaracharya <laughs> uses upanishads as the guiding light and that to some upanishads not all the upanishads some upanishads he uses as a guiding light and pushes through something like uh, bulldoze it to a particular view that's what it does the thing is where wherever we study in the bhagavad gita bhagavan is very direct telling that he is the highest nowhere has he said uh, that i am the saguna brahman you worship the nirguna brahman nowhere he has told that nowhere is it this two brahman problem does not is not there in the bhagavad gita it is not even there in the upanishads but in the upanishads there is at least a parancha parame vacha dvevava brahmano rupam parancha parame vacha something is there param brahman and apara brahman is mentioned in the upanishads but that has okay. a different meaning but shankaracharya uses that and brings that meaning of two brahmans into the gita part of it that's how shankaracharya does see but one thing we need to understand this is where the problem is unless you come to the samanvaya or the reconciliation you will not understand how to reconcile between these three systems because these the systems appear to be totally disconnected totally different from each other there does not seem to have any commonality between these systems okay that's how it is but wait till you get to the end where we talk about reconciliation that's an important thing only shri kesvi swami has introduced it in a very powerful way let us try to dig deep and find out hope this let me give, ask you whether this kind of a treatment is of use to anybody am i saying something which are so complicated and people have wasted their time in this uh, not having any real value out of this kind of discussions what's your view be honest yeah, straight to my face it is right See, here no my 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 view is this that we have to, we are looking at looking at all these things from shankara's point of view we just yeah. we have to understand we just have to understand what he is telling that's it very objectively Correct. yes true we have to be objective that see even to be objective we need to understand how it fits into the original verses right yes yeah you need to be convinced and what happens is here and for example anadi math right anadi math param brahma nasatan nasaduchate the word math shankaracharya himself changes it says that the math is stroka purnartham it is unnecessary word math which is used to complete the shloka which seems to be a very not so uh, justifiable stance but he takes it anyway and he proves it he says that that has to be the truth in fact he says that is a vrittikara mata the anadimat param brahma is a vrittikara mata which says math is a has value that is i am the para brahman to whom that jivatma to whom i am the para brahma that is a vrittikara mata and that is not acceptable to shankaracharya and say that math is useless so that's true uh, so what it is is he does not care about here small changes here and there in the in the verses and so does amanuja acharya if if you say uh, in the second chapter right there is so many so many usage of uh, singular um, one one aspect right for example um uh nitya sarvagatah stan ho sarvagatah means it is gone everywhere sarvatra gah it is there everywhere there shankara ramanuja acharya takes sarva dehe gatah in in all these different uh, beings he is there everywhere he is takes in a different way see ramana the words of gita has definitely issues krishna had to go and make it up easier for all of us and you know how krishna is he doesn't want to make it easy but uh, where there is a very different unique interpretation or very great difficulty for shankara is in the 12th chapter second shloka uh, when the when, when arjuna asks who is the yeah, uttama yeah definitely is, that is 
that is a clear yeah. problem for shankaracharya there and because he tries to he tries to argue uh, to uh, to the best of his uh, you know capability which is very powerful capability um, that uh, nirguna brahma is not even considered in the second chapter even though arjuna opens it up with that akshara and all he he dis dismisses that aspect and so that is why he doesn't agree with it but you need to understand yes. uh, shankaracharya is talking when everybody has gone to vaikuntha and in the kaushitik upanishad like you know uh, ko, ko you know ko ko uh, ko so you know kastvam uh, or something right that is kosi kosi who are you and the jeeva says soham yeah soham as me right so the thing is shankaracharya has gone already to that level and he views everything else from that level and that is why he thinks that everything else doesn't give a damn i don't give a damn about it so shankaracharya that is where he flies to the end you know, i was reading uh, for example, just to give you an in an analogy right analogy there is something called a natha sampradaya which is a bunch of uh, yogis sampradaya right i was just checking on the internet and one of the people recently who lived his name is nisarga datta maharaj who takes shankara's view extremely to the other end and then he lives that way and his guru his name is siddarameshwara that siddarameshwara it seems even though his guru taught him the method of the ant or the pipilika patha but he used the method of the bird or the shuka patha shukapata is fly to the goal if you see the uh, fruit there the uh, the uh, bird directly flies to the fruit but a ant goes slowly on the ground goes up the tree and then gets to the branch and get to the fruit and and eats the fruit the the step by step method or known as the pipilika patha and the direct path is the um shukapata so shankaracharya uses the shukapata and this that's i was uh, interested today because i was looking at some friends of mine talked to me about this natha sampradaya and uh, i was interested to, uh, curious about it and i didn't know that nisargadatta maharaj belonged to uh, the natha sampradaya in a way that siddarameshwara and siddarameshwara as uh, earlier uh, they have some connection with the samartha ramadas also tradition in the um in maharashtra and prior to that is the matsyendranath who is a yogi uh, in the form of fish or something who directly got initiation from shiva parvati long long time back so that is the natha sampradaya tradition i was just looking at it sir okay uh, then uh, sir one doubt is this uh, actually in fact uh, space bhakti initiated in uh, geeta if you go up there it is uh, he has told that in parvat parvat this uh, who does this uh, uh, parvati dharma who does it in form for the bhagwan uh, in the if he devotes it to god it's all it needs to gyana and that itself is bhakti is 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 that i don't know why you you there is a lot of uh, echo in your sound system it's not uh, very difficult to understand you now you are even you need uh, you need to talk to some uh, computer expert to make sure that your computer is uh, uh, you know the sound system is good oh. i can no, understand your question no sir in that uh, same uh, this one chapter there is bhakti initiated in geeta when uh, uh, that ganguli uh, uh, sir has uh, told that if, uh, what is parvati uh, 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 what is it? If Parvati, uh, if, uh, if that devotion done in uh, towards uh, God is without any karma, it leads to jnana, and that itself is bhakti. It is it, it, it has stated there, sir. Can you explain that point? Ah, bhakti initiated. See, it is can you this one? Yeah, this one, right? That is bhakti initiated initiated in the Gita, right? Ah, see, yes, uh, see, this we have already done in the last class, by the way. you should see the last class i see in the last one a second last two classes we have we have gone through this 
See, yes. Bhakti Yoga is the highest uh, Karma Yoga to Dhyana Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. They are the progressive disciplines in the order which is all included in Karma Yoga only. Karma Yoga includes Dhyana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga also. So for Shankaracharya, Bhakti Yoga is the highest level of Karma Yoga which is Ishvara Sharanagati. Surrender to Ishvara is the highest Bhakti Yoga for them. Yes, right? Yes, and then, uh, and then uh, you see that uh, if you go further, so he see, basically supports everything about devotion to Saguna, even the 12th chapter. And he mm -hmm. says that is the highest for the Karma Yogi. Right? So yes. Bhakti is in, important because that is the state we are, we are in the relative world. So bhakti to Ishvara is very important to Shankaracharya. But that only gives chitta shuddhi or purity of mind only. It will not give anything else. Jnana has to come again. See, that is why we need to understand the interface between bhakti and jnana. What is the interface in, in Shankara Bhashya between the bhakti which only purifies the mind and jnana is jnana the result of, of result and it's actually realization that it is Brahman only? Is that moksha? What is that jnana? Is jnana the path? Or is jnana the final fruit? This is a very important question in the, in the Shankara Bhashya. So that is why jnana initiated in the Gita, I'm trying to go through it. The unfortunate uh, obstacle I found is 13 chapter 2, 13 chapter 1, these are very difficult to understand in Shankara Bhasha. I was uh, like, it's pretty, you know, I'm driving on a highway where there are no bumps and things like that. You suddenly put speed bumps uh, at every, uh, you know, every foot, you put a, a speed bump and I'm not able to go further. This is problems in this particular shl uh, shlokas. Very difficult. He uses a lot of older people's philosophies, try to attack a lot of other people here. I'm not able to get the essence quickly. Next time, I will try to speed up, try to get some essence of it, and hopefully we will go through the uh, this whole thing, this whole section, till uh, at least Agnana and Maya, which are destroyed by Jnana. So at least till then, this point, next time we'll explain. And next time we'll take up this particular Agnana and uh, stuff. Maybe even that is complex, as you see. You know, he refers to... 20, 30, 40 shlokas in the Bhagavad Gita, and you have to go through the explanations of Shankara there, or else these concepts won't be clear. Or I will have to do one thing. Next time, I have to sit down and study all these things in a very, very powerful fashion, make about 20 slides, and summarize it. Let's see what we can do. Yes. This uh, this Natha Sampradaya seems to go towards extremely uh, no-God uh, kind of uh, principle. Uh, it yeah. seems to be extreme Advaita. Extreme the, Advaita, uh, you're right. No, no, you, in that Nasambra, I don't know, I was surprised. The Siddharameshwara person is uh, the extreme Advaita, okay? And that is yes. why Nisarga Dutta Maharaj followed him and became extreme Advaita. But his yes. guru, the Siddharameshwara has a guru, guru. I'm forgetting that name of that guru. I'm totally... God Siddheshwar, God Siddheshwar Maharaj, that one. Yes, I think so, or somebody else. No, his guru's name is slightly different. Okay. It is not Kardasideshwara. It's somebody the else. Inche -geri they are all Maharashtians. Maharashtians. Yeah, yeah. Some Inchegeri uh, Sampradaya or something. Inchegeri Sampradaya is what um, the Siddharameshwara got into the Inchegeri Sampradaya. But his guru is different. Siddharameshwara okay. has a guru. Okay. And that guru did not uh, teach the extreme Advaita. He taught the Pipilika Mata. That is a step by step, step by step understanding and realization of Paramatma. Yes, and that is close to the Ramdasi Sampradaya, the uh, the the Dasboda, the Dasboda kind of thing, the uh, Rama, the the worship Rama, Swami Ramdas. Oh, okay, uh, okay. That, that Ramadasi one. Um, unfortunately, I'm surprised. I'm confused because this the Siddhara, the Siddhara Meshwara uses Dasboda to explain. Yes, yes. And I'm he confused how he chooses a path which is different from what he's explaining. <laughs> yes. And he has actually translated the Dasboda to Kannada, the Marathi oh. Dasboda, Siddhara Meshwara. Really? Yes. Okay, it's very interesting because my friend translated it into English. 
<laughs> so okay. I have to check it out. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Namaste. Asmat Guru Bhiyam Mahasmat Parma Guru Bhiyam Mahasmat Saro Guru Bhiyam Mahasri Krishna Prabhu and Prabhu Nain Mahasri Lakshmi and Sama Prabhu Nain Mahasri Lakshmi. I have the number of Prabhu Nain Mahasaro Mahasri Krishna Prabhu. Namaskaram Krishna. Namaskaras.